Blue Book, turn to page 20. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love, may each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, <coughs> hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. You may be seated, Brother Mike. Well, good evening, everybody. got your Bibles with you, turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Try not to keep you too long this evening, get you back home. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. Uh, and <clears throat> It's a marvelous, marvelous chapter on uh, <clears throat> Christ's finished work in our hearts, on the security of a believer, <clears throat> and uh, the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts and our lives there. So, <clears throat> in just a way to open up here, <clears throat> in Romans 8, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 28 there, it's a uh, uh, closing section of Paul's great treatise on the Christian life in here, what, what God has done for you when he saved you, uh, the continued work God's doing in us after he saved us, <clears throat> and the profound, the profound things about these scriptures. He talks about God's foreknowledge. He talks about his predestination. And uh, uh, scares some Baptists to death. You talk about predestination, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I've had <clears throat> I've had some say, "Do you believe in predestination?" I said, "Well, sure, I believe in it." I said, "The Bible teaches it. I'd be a fool not to believe it." And uh, and uh, you believe that? <clears throat> they said, "You believe that there's these people going to be saved no matter what?" I said, "I believe in the <clears throat> foreknowledge of God before He created the world." God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows each and every single person. Before he created Adam, 4,000 years later in the church age, he knew every individual that would be saved, when they'd be saved, 
And God knows all that. I said, God knows it all. I said, do you, I said, do you think he's ignorant or something? They don't know this stuff? And um, so Paul talks about uh, <clears throat> nobody gets saved with, uh, without God doing it. We don't get saved when we want to. We don't, you know, people say, well, I did it this way. This way I did. Well, I didn't do nothing. God did it all, you know. He, he did the, the Holy Spirit did the convicting and the drawing. And God did the saving. And that's how we get saved, you know. And the day you got saved, God knew you'd get saved that day. He secures you when you get saved. And the Holy Spirit seals us that day. You can never, ever in any fashion or any way, ever lose your salvation. Once you're born again, you're secure for eternity. And uh, those that have not been saved yet, they're also secure in eternity. You say, how can you say that? Because God knows who they are. I don't, but he does. And uh, that's why I told people, I said, that's why we witness to people and we visit people and witness to people. Because we don't know who's going to be saved and who's not. The Holy Spirit does that internal work on a person's heart. And then, and then they hear the word of God, and then God draws them and they get saved. Now, I've witnessed people many times over the years. And, uh, and before I left the room, hospital room, home or wherever, you know, uh, I'd bow with them and, and share Calvary with them and the plan of salvation, and they'd get saved. And many, many, many times. People at work all over the country. I've hauled prisoners back on my cruiser and witnessed to them. I've had them to get saved. And uh, I've had people say, you think a, a jailbird could get saved? I said, well, yeah. Yeah, they can get saved. I said, they still have to do their jail time. But uh, they don't get out of jail because they got saved, you know. They don't tell the judge, well, I got saved last week, you know. And, uh, and uh, actually, I've heard them tell that in the courtroom. I said, well, judge, I've straightened my life out and got right with the Lord. And he said, uh, well, that's good. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. After you do your time, you can be a help to other people then. And uh, so uh, that's the way it goes. Anyway, let's get into the lesson here tonight. <clears throat> <clears throat> We're predestinated, the Bible says. We'll read some here in 28 and 29. Paul said, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, that's God's foreknowledge there, and did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we uh, then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that con condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter nay and all these things we are more than conquerors <clears throat> through him that loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities that's uh, Satan and demons nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other, the words creatures as in the original, it's created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, we're predestinated for his, God's glory when he saved us there. And, 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 uh, the verse there I want to touch on for a second <clears throat> is uh, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? If God didn't spare Jesus, but he sacrificed his own son on the cross, 
God himself in a human body became the sacrifice and, and, and poured all the judgment upon himself there at Calvary. That was God hanging on the cross. Poured all the judgment and every sin that mankind had ever committed, the worst uh, atrocity that Satan could, could come up and tempt somebody to do, God poured all of that on himself on the cross. Now, if he did all of that for us on the cross, once he saves us, we become a son or a daughter. Would he not do more for us then? then he, I mean, how, you, you think, how could he do more then? That if he loved us that much to go through that for us, then once we become his children, the love is beyond anything we can comprehend. So he predestinated there <clears throat> that we would be saved. And when that time come, uh, the Holy Spirit dealt with our hearts and God convicted us of our sins, and he drawed us to salvation. And that's what happened there. Then uh, we find out, I read verses 31 through 39, we're preserved for glory. Once we're, we're predestinated, we, and God says you, you, you'll be saved, he knows everybody will be saved, and when they get saved then, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and then they're preserved until glory. There's no way you can lose your salvation. You didn't... You didn't earn your salvation. You didn't do anything to get your salvation. God did it. And therefore, God is the progenitor of that salvation that he gave us. He paid the price. He done the calling. He forgave our sins and saved us there. So therefore, it's God's salvation in our hearts, not ours, you know. Uh, the Bible talked about in, in the Gospels there that, you know, that Jesus said we're in the hand of God and no man can take us, pluck us from the hand of the Father. And therefore, so you didn't save yourself, you can't unsave yourself. And uh, that's hard for a lot of people to, to concept there. But when we talk about what God has done, and all through the Bible, even through the Old Testament, and I'm going to use some Old Testament things, uh, examples here tonight on this. <clears throat> no matter how good you are after you get saved, no matter how bad you are, uh, you can't forfeit that salvation. Now, if we decide we're going to be bad or we yield ourselves to the flesh and do things we shouldn't, there's chastisement that comes with that. There's consequences come with that. But God's love never ceases. And, he, and, and a great thing there, he says, you know, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Even when we do something bad, and we, we deal with that, and we, God has to deal with that. He still works that out. Even when bad things happen in our life, I mean, whether it be a, a, a financial collapse, whether it be we lose our home, whether we have a death in our family, whatever happens, bad things happen. Whether our health just fails and we're just, and we're just not able to do anything anymore, God works that out for our good. He didn't say that that in itself was good, but he works it out for a good. He takes that and works it out. Have you ever had a, uh, just a, a blow up, a mess up, a bad thing to happen, and, and you just, you don't know what, you don't know how it's going to come out? You know, I'm not asking for volunteers, but, if you, if, you know, you know if you have or not. And then down the road, somehow, some way, God worked that thing out, and it worked out. And it worked out better than you ever imagined it worked out. So that's a promise from God. He's, he's never unaware of everything that goes on in our life. He constantly knows. He knows all about us, everything about us. And you say, well, why, am I, why do I <clears throat> sin? We still have this flesh nature. Do we have to yield to it? No, we do not. Do we yield to it? Yes, we do yield to it. And so... He, let, he don't tempt us. God can't tempt us with sin, and he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't be a holy God if he did. But he allows us to be tempted. He allows us to be tested and tried. He allows these things to come before us. Then we have a choice, you know. I'm going to do what God wants me to do, or I'm, I think I'm going to yield over here a little bit. We have a choice. And there's consequences for those choices there. When Jesus... Uh, God in the human flesh walked on this earth and the temptations of Satan come at him. Do you think that they, that they weren't real temptations? They absolutely was. The Bible talks about when he, he was tempted above all men as we are. 
in all points like we are, yet without sin. So every temptation that come our way came his way. And he had a choice too in, in his humanity, in the human flesh. And he dealt with it the proper way. And how did he deal with it? Him, God himself in the flesh, dealt with it with the word of God and defeated the temptation. He laid us a path out there to how we could deal with that. So, you know, as old Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it, you know. Well, the devil tempts us, I assure you that. He tempts us in lots of ways. But he don't make us do anything. He just lays the bait out there. And some of us nibble at it a little. And some of us just laugh it up like a dog that hadn't eaten a week, you know. We just, we want more, you know. And uh, that's the way we are. But uh, to give you this here tonight, <clears throat> we have blessed assurance here. Paul says, we know, and I've stressed that many times on that verse. I've preached on this verse a, a, a dozen times, I guess, over the years. We know, therefore, we don't indulge in wishful thinking. We don't hope. We don't wonder. We don't guess. We don't think. We know. God has spoken, and we know. Either God's word is true and you believe it as an inspired, infallible word of God, or you don't believe it, one of the two. It can't be both ways. You can't have a cake, eat it too. You know, you're going to have to either believe God's word or not believe it. I know God said this, but, but what? Is it God's word? I know God said it, but, well, is God a liar? Is that what you're saying? He didn't mean what he said, you know? We take it at face value there. And God's spoken there. His word cannot be broken. God's word can never be broken because it's divine and it's holy. God says in verse 28 there, all things work together. And I've had people say, well, you tell me how this is going to work out. And I said, well, I can't tell you. But I said, God knows how it's going to work out. It's going to work out good. <clears throat> I remember years ago at South High School, there was a, uh, a girl, a student got run over in the parking lot, hit with a car and killed. <clears throat> I was a chaplain at the sheriff's department and, uh, and I was close so I went down there <clears throat> and the officers were there working just, you know, and I was talking to them. And uh, I talked to the, uh, went over to the father was over there and I introduced myself to him, you know, and, you know, and, and uh, I wouldn't speak his name, couldn't even remember it anyway, it's been so many years, but uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, and uh, I said, uh, I said, I know you're hurting. The best I remember what I said, no, but I said, you know, I said, the Lord knows you're hurting. That's the most important thing. He said, he said, don't start that God stuff with me. He said, you tell me what kind of God, loving God, would let this child of mine lay right there dead in the car. And he just, he said, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say, and a few more choice words with it, and then he turned around and walked off. And uh, no matter what happened, we know. And I've used that verse. I have used it myself a number of times over the years. I, sa I said, God, you said in your word right here that it work out for my good according to your glory. And uh, I've even told him the book and the verse number you know in Romans 8 verse 28 there Lord you said that and uh, <clears throat> I have yet to have it not work out yet not to work out he works it out for our good <clears throat> and notice he says for his glory his glory is for us to be more like he wants us to be he, he can take that situation and work it out to where we'll grow spiritually from it and be more like Christ wants us to be. He's, God is preparing each of his children for the kingdom, for heaven one day, for the glory. He's, it's what he's preparing us for. When we get there, we'll be ready to go. We'll be fired up. We'll be ready for everything he's got for us. But right down here and now, we have to be ready for this. Instead of complaining and moaning and, and whining, and crying, and uh, I started to say a couple words I probably shouldn't say, <laughs> but uh, 
that's a, you know, word you hear all the time. And uh, when we start about moaning and complaining, you know, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, so we praise God. I told y'all, I've said it more than once here. I said, you know, when we get up of a morning, sometimes I wake up in the morning and just about every morning now, and I'm stiff and I'm hurting. My back hurts, my, my but back surgery, knee surgery, shoulder surgery, neck surgery, and uh, probably some more I can't remember. But when I get up, I hurt. And uh, <clears throat> But when we get up of a morning, you know, maybe got in bed late, maybe a Sunday night, you got in bed late, and whew, it don't seem like anymore. You lay down, close your eyes, till it's time to get up and go to work, ain't it? I mean, and, and you know, and you lay there and you throw your eyes open, you say, Good Lord, it's morning. Or do we say, Good morning, Lord? Good morning, Lord. I'm thankful that I'm able to get up, not as fast as I used to could. I don't jump and hit the floor. I kind of roll out now and stretch a little. <laughs> and, uh, pray there on the side of the bed before I get up and uh, but I, I'm thankful have a thankful heart people be thankful you know go over there with uh, um, Nancy Reiner go over there Monday and <clears throat> talk to Nancy and this is a lady or caretaker comes over lady lives over condo next to her comes over there every morning helps her get dressed and and put salve on her legs and everything so her legs are, are just swelled so big you know and, and and then she has to put those stockings on her leg and everything and and, uh, and I said Mondays and Fridays she goes to to uh, physical therapy and works out and I said Nancy you gonna go work out today and she said yeah and I said where am she said I dread it but she said I'm a going and she said do you know Mike she said there's some people who can't even get out of bed and she said I'm thankful I can and I said, well, that's the attitude you ought to have. And she said, I'm going to go as long as I can go. I'm going to go. I said, well, Debbie's getting you ready there. I said, she's slicking your legs up there so she can get them tight socks on you there. And she said, that makes them slide on better, you know. But <clears throat> it's just a good attitude about it. And uh, she'll come to church and come up at the sidewalk on that cane and can just barely go. And I heard Bill Farmer one day saw him sitting back there, back there in the vestibule, and Nancy's coming up the sidewalk, and he said, don't you look right there. And he said, can't hardly get up through there, and he said, we've got all these people that, you know, they may have stumped their toe last night, and they can't come now. You know, all these excuses people have for not coming to the house of God. You know, and uh, so <clears throat> all these things here that the Lord does, and... Uh, all things work together for every one of God's children, for better or worse. All things work together for good, for those who are his people and those who are in his purpose. They work together. We don't understand sometimes why this happened, why that happened, why this happened. And uh, why did I lose my job? And then you end up getting a better job. You know, why did this happen? So uh, God knows what's going on. And I was going to use Jacob tonight. An Old Testament patriarch shows us how all these things work out together. Now, Jacob <clears throat> Jacob was a called, predestined saint of God. God had a job for Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Abraham went to offer Isaac. God took care of all that. You know the story. Isaac had Jacob and Esau and and Jacob, uh, he was a scoundrel. I mean, he was slicker and uh, snot on the doorknob. He was just, he was just something, you know. And you know the story, hey, who do this brother out of the birthright, which was Jacob's anyway. God already had that plan for him. <clears throat> so he goes off to live with his mom's brother and him, his uncle Laman and him. And uh, so... He's there, but on the way there now, he's, you know, he stopped at Bethel and a little place called Bethel. wasn't a town or nothing. It was just an open area. And he had prayer there and built an altar, altar and worshiped God and, and went on his way. And he was just going there for a little while. He ended up being there 20 years. And that 20 years he was there, he began to work for Laman. Laman was a big cattle man, had all kinds of livestock, sheep and cattle and goats and and Jacob worked for him, and and uh, then uh, he fell in love with Jacob's daughter. Jacob had two daughters, Rachel and Leah. He fell in love with Rachel. She was the younger one and the pretty one, no doubt. And uh, but uh, 
and he wanted to get married. So Laban was a schemer too, you know. And he said, <clears throat> "Aren't you give me seven years?" And he said, "I'll let you marry seven years. Work for me seven years." Well, the Bible said that Jacob said he agreed to it right off, and said he worked for him, and said the seven years just seemed like it passed by, as we'd say overnight. Just, psh, it's gone. So we got, you know. Anyway, when he got ready to get married and the wedding nights, you know, and back then, and they had their their wedding tent over there where they was going to live. You know, they had tents. They didn't have electric lights. They had candles. They didn't have lanterns, you know. They had candles and stuff. And, and uh, they they had the wedding. And, and I've explained this to young people a lot. And they, they got married. They, they were veiled, heavy veiled, you know. So, you know, they did all the white furs and everything. And he got married. And then they went to their tent. And uh, in their tent there, I mean, it was dark as a, as uh, inside of a dog's mouth, you know, they couldn't see nothing. So uh, then when, when it got daylight the next day, he woke up, <clears throat> they woke up and maybe throwed the flap back there or something, and it was Leah he had married. Wasn't Rachel? He said, good Lord, what has happened here? I can imagine, t- I mean, he, he was beside himself. He went straight to his pappy-in-law, and they had another big quarrel over that, and... Uh, so he agreed, you know, to, well, I'll let you marry Rachel too. Seven more years of labor. So he, he did. You know, you know how the story went? It goes on and on. And <clears throat> he got hooked so many times by layman. But now remember, Jacob was a schemer too. He'd done his hooking in his time. And uh, so he, he headed out. And uh, he, he got his family together and he took off. And gone about three days before Laban realized it. And then Laban was on his trail, heavy. He was riding heavy to catch up with him. And, and full plans of killing him. And God had spoke to Laban on him and told him, you know, it's, you know, you don't harm him. You don't touch him. And uh, so we see Jacob sitting in his tent out there on the way back home, wringing his hands with grief. A great cry of desperation breaks in his lips. Ever since he returned, he's back in the promised land, the edge of it now. Everything seems to have gone wrong. If any man was a man called according to God's purpose, Jacob was that man. God had a purpose, and he had a plan for Jacob. And Jacob got saved there at Bethel, trusted God, and asked God to to be his saver and provider, and God took care of Jacob prior to him getting saved. We look at predestination. God already knew what he's going to do with Jacob. God doesn't know what he's going to do. Jacob would be the head of the nation Israel. Through his 12 sons would be the 12 tribes of Israel. So God knew what he's going to do with Jacob. And uh, you see all the things Jacob got into. I mean, and God still loved him, still protected him, still worked out things for him, got chastised many times for the things he had done. But God worked it out. So he's back in the land now, back in the place where God had uh, had put his name, where he met with his people. But everything else seemed to be conspiring against him there. He barely escaped being uh, plundered there uh, by laymen. He was pursued, uh, and uh, by laymen he was uh, he had purchased his peace with Esau. That's his brother coming from the other direction, with four hundred men. So he give him all kinds of cattle and sheep and goats, and he give him a fortune in today's money. There. And <clears throat> he, he got through that. God protected him through that. Then they went to a place there at Shechem, and they, they set camp there. Well, the, the, the king's son there at Shechem just fell head over heels with uh, Dinah, his daughter. Just I mean, just fell in love with her. And uh, he seduced her and disgraced the family. And uh, now his son, two of his sons, Simeon and Levi, brought a fearful vengeance on this man and the men of that town. They slaughtered a bunch of people. And uh, so he was now terrified because he said the other, tr- the other towns and tribes, he said, they'll, they'll kill us for this. He said, we're not. So they packed up and headed on, heading towards home. Judah, the best of the bunch, of the bad, I guess the best of the bad you'd call him. Uh, you remember him, uh, he disgraced himself in Genesis 38 and uh, t- 
Tamar, who was married to one of his sons, and he had died, and Judah promised her, well, when this younger son, just a kid then, when he grows up, you can have him. And, well, he, he grew up, and he didn't give her to him. And so she, she played the scene of a harlot, set a trap for him, and hooked him. And uh, then uh, he was going to have her killed, you know. He, he sent a man back to pay her the money for the, the night of uh, pleasure. And the man goes to pay her, and he said, there's nobody there for that man. So then they're having a, they're having a big uh, wing ding there, and she comes up, and she brings, he left her his signet ring and uh, his uh, staff as a guarantee of a payment, you know. That'd be like you owe me some money, and you say, well, I can't pay you yet, but I'll, I'll leave you my $500 chainsaw. You know, till I pay you. So, you know, he owed me $200, leave me a $500 chainsaw. I hope he don't come back and pay me. I'll just keep the chainsaw. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> she exposed him. She said the man, because she was pregnant now by his baby, and he was going to have her killed. And she said the man that this child belongs to is the man that owns this ring, this signet ring, and this staff. And Judah looked at that and thought, that's mine. And he remembered what happened. So Judah messed up. We see a mess there in Jacob's life. <clears throat> then uh, we go back, we go on a little farther there. And beloved Rachel had died. Rachel, his favorite wife, she died. And her son Joseph had, had uh, disappeared and presumed to be dead. Uh, torn to pieces by wild animal, the, the brothers, y'all know the story on Joseph, had done to him. And uh, now the great phantom is raging in the promised land, and keeping the family alive requires that the sons go back down to Egypt for more grain and food. They've done been down once. Uh, Joseph now is the prime minister down there, and they didn't recognize him because after all those years, and he looked like an Egyptian, dressed like an Egyptian, and spoke Egyptian. And anyway, <clears throat> he kept, uh, he kept uh, Simeon with him and sent the other boys back home and said, when you come back, bring the younger brother with you. So uh, now Jacob's looking at that. If he sends the boys back, he's got to send Benjamin with them. Food's needed. The boys must go back. But they refused to go without Benjamin. And Jacob, Jacob said all these things. He said, he said all these things against me. Jacob wailed. Little did he know that all things were working out for his good. Little did he know that God is working now. Joseph is alive, seated at the right hand of power in Egypt, the Grand Vizier of Egypt, and all the things Joseph went through. Brothers hated him, sold him into a, a slave caravan. He's 17 years old. He goes off to Egypt. He's, he gets bought by Potiphar and in his house, and God watched over him there. And next thing you know, he's running the household. Potiphar's wife lies on him. Uh, he gets chucked out of there and into prison. He's not in prison long till he is everything's going good there for him. And then the, the Pharaoh had a dream, and then one of the prison guys remembered, I know a guy that told us what we did, told us what was going to happen, and it happened. So he brought him out, and he answered the Pharaoh's dreams. He said, I can't, but he said, God, the God I serve can. And God prepared Joseph for that time to, to take care of Jacob and the nation of Israel. Now... We said all that and say this. Look at all the bad things that they went through. <clears throat> but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And it's hard for us to understand sometimes when we're hurting. When we're hurting deep. You know. When we have a, I guess the deepest hurt we have is <clears throat> when we have a loved one die. But I, you know, I look at everybody dies. If Jesus don't come back before long, we're all going to die. Everybody's going to die. If I lose a mother, I'm not the only one that had a mother. 
if, if I lose a child, and, and hope pray I never do, but I'm not the only one that has a child. I'm not the only one in this church that's lost a child. You know, so if 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 my wife dies, and uh, I hate to think of that thought, but I do quite often. You know, if she dies, I'm not the only one ever lost a mate. You know, and and we were talking over earlier. You know, the Bible says that. We all have, the, the, our days are appointed. We have days, when the day we're born before we're ever born. God knows the second we'll be born, the minute, and he knows the very minute we'll die, and we'll go into eternity. And uh, nothing's going to change that. It's, it's out there. And I've already lived a lot longer than I thought I would. I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I never thought I'd live to retire. And uh, I've been retired now for nine years. I never thought I'd live that long. And, uh, so uh, with Sue and Larry, me and Sue and uh, Ruth were talking to her before church, and we were talking about us getting old and everything. <clears throat> and I said, since we started the church here in <clears throat> 1981, <clears throat> I said, there's a lot of people that we started the church with that's not here anymore, a bunch of people. And uh, I think about them all the time. I go over down these pews and looking around and think about all these people. You know, it's gone. And I said, our time will come for the same, too, if the Lord don't come back. So in closing here, <clears throat> as, uh, <clears throat> as the hymn writer uh, phrased it there, William uh, Cowper in 1774, he said, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The, the clouds ye so much dread are big in mercy are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. All the things that uh, we do work together for good for those who love God, who are wrapped up in his eternal purpose, and he blesses his own. Darkest things may seem, there's another side of our circumstances. Think about this. There's another side to the circumstances we're in, and that's God's side. God has a purpose for that and a reason. And I told God a number of times, I said, Lord, I don't know what your purpose is in this. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. But uh, I know it's it's for the best. I, I have to believe that in your word. It's for the best. Now, was, was the time trying? They were. Was the time long? It was. I think one, it was 14 months long. And uh, it was rough. But it worked out, and it worked out great. And I thank God many, many, many times for that in my life. So a little uh, poem here, and we're gone. <clears throat> it says, Not till the looms are silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needed and the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. So God has these things laid out for us. We don't have to. What do we do? You just keep right on keeping on. You just, you stay faithful. You stay consistent. <clears throat> stay in church. Read God's word every day. Pray several times a day. And uh, be a witness for Christ wherever you are. Be a good husband. Be a good wife. Be a good father. If you got children, be uh, a good child if you're here and you're young tonight. And uh, you trust God. It'll work out. Amen. And uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, does anybody have anything to say before we close? Thank you on uh, live stream tonight for watching, and you all will watch later on on YouTube. And uh, Pastor will be back the next time. And uh, may God bless you all. Does anybody have anything to say? Tim, answer you dismiss us with a word of prayer. <clears throat>